We continue on our interference and RM day today, and uh, it's my great pleasure to have Marcinissa here, who has come over from France, from Paris. Um, yeah, despite the strike. There was a strike as usual, so um, yeah. that's quite a, the normal state of uh, Air France, I presume. And um, so we're glad you made it, actually, uh, for today. I, I'm surprised, actually, that there's strike on Wednesdays, because Wednesday is a day where... All the week, all the week. The whole week, all yeah, right. Yeah, usually, don't do a day. I mean, it's okay. Business. Usually, the strike is on Tuesdays and Thursdays, not too close to the weekend. No, no. I mean, okay, just okay, take okay, all the okay, week. It's okay, okay. Easier. All right. I had scheduled you on purpose on Wednesday, thinking mm -hmm. that Thursday and Tuesday you might have been on. Okay. Anyway, so we're here. Um, he's got very strong background. Physical lay, got his PhD in uh, 2006 in France. Uh, worked for Orange for a few years uh, before he started working uh, with Sajemcom. Uh, together with Thierry Le Stable, whom we had here on, on Monday. We're together in a project, uh, Bifemto. So he's going to explain us, essentially, um, Sajim Combs, uh, his vision on how interference can be managed in, in Femto cells. Close it all yours. Yeah, thanks, Misha. Okay, and, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Massini Salam from Sajim Combs. Um, Is the microphone Yeah, I think it's on. No? Yeah. It's on? No problem? Okay. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I took a Spanish company so that I'm sure to be uh, on time uh, f for this talk. So I'm going to, to, to talk about interference management in co-channel uh, femtocell deployment. Uh, you may recognize many topics that, we address, that, that uh, my previous colleagues addressed, uh, let's say this morning or uh, even the day before, but repetition is always good. So uh, the outline of my presentation will be uh, to talk about the femtocell uh, deployment and in particular the worst case scenario which is the co-channel in downlink when the macrocell user in the is in the vicinity of a femtocell. Basically this is the, let's say, uh, starting point when you're doing uh, research on femtocell. Um, then I will just give some, uh, an overview on the 3GPP status uh, on interference management. Uh, as you know, you've th th there are plenty of topics uh, that were mentioned this morning uh, by Zubin. Uh, basically the ICIC uh, framework and so on. And then um, I'm going to talk about uh, how we can evaluate the performance uh, of such interference management uh, schemes that we develop or that are proposed by 3GPP uh, using system level simulation. I'm not sure that every one of you is aware on how we do system level simulations. No, yes. Everyone has already heard about that. I mean, if you're all an expert in, in that field, so you'll find this uh, part uh, quite easy and uh, relaxing, so you'll be able to check your SMS and so on. And <laughs> but uh, uh, after, after this presentation, uh, this part on system level simulation, we'll, we'll talk about this famous dual stripe, green model, and so on that you've uh, already heard. Then we'll just, uh, just give some kind of result on evaluate, some kind of performance evaluation uh, on power control and some famous frequency partitioning schemes uh, all related to femtocell before concluding and then we'll be able to, to, to learn. So as it's already known, uh, the femtocells are, let's say, more usually um, deployed by the users, meaning that operators do not have any control on their locations. Um, um, but basi basically, this makes the, the network planning uh, a, a bit hard. So, femtocell is, is seen as a small cell in the 3GPP terminology. In, in the 3GPP terminology, small cells, you've got femtocells and you've got picocells. Picocells that, that are the smallest cells that are let's say, controlled by the operator when he's deploying them, okay? But just to say that this is the frontier that we've got between pico, pico, pico cells and femto cells. And femto cells, they are user deployed uh, in some, uh, well, you can buy one or it depends on the operator policy. And at the end of the day, you've got this cellular access at your home. And um, there, there is three uh, policies um, that are uh, coming with the femto cells when you, have, when you want to access uh, the cellular network. You've got the closed access policy, meaning that you've, there is a list, a closed to Krieger uh, group um, list. And if you do not belong to this list, 
then you're not allowed to connect to the femtocell to have access to the uh, network, to the cellular network. Then you've got some kind of uh, open access, meaning that, okay, everyone is invited to the party, you can just come. It's open bar and so on. And uh, you've got some kind of uh, hybrid access, meaning that, okay, everyone is invited, but there is a, v a VIP room. And this VIP room is just for the one who is paying uh, the femtocell uh, femto or uh, what you have to know is that a femtocell to be able to connect to the network or to the core network of the operator, it goes through the DSL line or the broadband line of the subscriber. So meaning that the one who, which is paying, I mean, who is paying will have, let's say, this uh, VIP uh, status. And as mentioned uh, before, uh, since spectrum is a scarce resource, and, I mean, uh, co-channel deployment uh, has received a lot of interest because, you know, th this spectrum is um, paid a, a big amount of money by operators, so they want to reuse it uh, at the maximum. Um, but uh, with this co-channel deployment, meaning that we've got the same carrier for both the macro cell and the femto cell, there is some kind of worst case, especially with, uh, in the downlink, with this uh, closed access policy. And it's true that when you've got your femtocells and you're here, say you've got a, a great connections, but if a macro user uh, comes nearby and he, do, do not be, uh, he does not belong to, to your uh, CSG list, then he will suffer severe uh, interference. The same for another femto femtocell users which do not belong to the same CSG as the one that you've got. So basically, if uh, this is a neighbor that you don't like, I mean, it's okay. But uh, for an operator point of view, this is a customer, so we have to uh, take uh, careful care uh, on, on this kind of situations. So that's why we need some kind of interference management uh, solutions. So for this talk, I will mainly uh, put my focus on this downlink with a closed access policy. But this closed access policy will be either uh, independent from, for each femtocell, or we can envisage that a group of femtocell will share the same CSG. Yes, please. Why is this case for the downlink? Because when you're in, uh, as mentioned by uh, Zubin uh, this morning, uh, when you in, uh, the, the downlink, this is when you can uh, check, for instance, uh, information that are broadcasted by the network. This is in downlink. If you're not allowed to uh, access to the femtocell, you cannot let basically what the femtocell is transmitting, okay, you will be able to decode it. But since you do not belong to the CSG or list of the, of the femtocell, you will not be able to connect to the femtocells, okay? And since this femtocell is transmitting, or you see that you, or you receive a power which is higher coming from this femtocell, than from the macro cell, you won't be able either to detect some things coming from the macro cell. Okay, basically this is the this is why this is the, the, the worst case because you don't have access anymore. You cannot receive. But this uh, closed access uh, policy, I mean, okay, this is just like your Wi-Fi uh, router and so on. I mean, you don't want anyone to, to be able to connect. That's how life is working. So, I mean, this will be the, 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 the main scenario, the main focus. The, there are other issues in the airplane, for instance, but, okay, I, w I want to address that uh, today. Uh, so, you have any questions? No? I think it's quite clear. Uh, so, to start, I will just recall uh, the 3GPP status on interference management, as uh, Zubin talked uh, about this morning. So, you will find redundancy and so on, but I think that repetition is always good. And uh, just before... Uh, entering into this ICIC uh, intercell inter interference coordination uh, mechanisms, uh, you have to, 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 to have the architecture in mind, the overall architecture. Uh, e not B is basically a macro cell or a pico cell or a micro cell. I mean, uh, those are basically deployed by the operator. Okay, they are connected to the MME mobility management entity and the serving gateway to then be able to connect to the core network of the operator, and this is done through the S1 interface, okay? 
and uh, some kind of new features introduced by LTE are this X2 interface that are connecting E not B uh, to each other. I mean, those are just logical links, and you can, um, let's say, only uh, for the time of the, let's say, release 9 and release, uh, up to release 9, only macrocell, microcell, and picocell were allowed to, 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 to have this X2 interface. Okay? Then we've got uh, our home E not B. Basically, this is the 3GPP uh, pentocell uh, name. Okay? And um, those may, uh, those femtocells can connect directly to the network uh, using this uh, MME or serving gateway, okay? Or they can go through some kind of gateway, the home, um, home in the big gateway uh, with an S1 interface, and then this gateway connects to the MME and serving gateway. Uh, for uh, a B, this gateway is seen as an MME, and for the MME, let's, see, uh, let's say this gateway is seen as an E node B, okay, just to have a, a, an idea. And this, this use of gateway, I mean, th this is to have some kind of concentrator. And if you uh, think about uh, the actual femtocell that are deployed, which are 3G uh, or HSPA uh, uh, femtocells, they all uh, use a home node B gateway. You, they all uh, connect to the core network using this architecture. Okay, and uh, what's new in the release 10 of the 3GPP is that you may have some kind of X2 connections between he node Bs, but between specific he node Bs. I mean, it truly really depends on the, uh, let's say, CSG um, policy uh, that, that, that you apply on the home he node B. So this... Connectivity means uh, in a building, uh, all of the home E node Bs are need to be connected, or what? Uh, what do you mean by connectivity? Means the X2 interface. X2 interface. Well, usually this X2 interface uh, are meant for femtocell that are or base stations that are, let's say that uh, are uh, that may con uh, interact with each other. I mean, X2 is used, of course, for interference. Uh, for IC, IC mechanism, mm -hmm. but it's also used for handover. To facilitate the handover, you, you use the X2 interface, basically. Those home node, uh, these, those uh, he node Bs, they have to, 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 to be, let's say, some, not really in the vicinity, but uh, they, they, oh. they, 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 they must, let's say, have a way to interconnect to each other. I mean, okay. Have when the when separate uh, in node Bs. So to go back to your question about the femtocells, yes, those are... Uh, Basically, X2 between femtocells which are, let's say, in, in the same building. Same building, which is based on spatial co -loc location. Uh, yes, but yeah, it makes more sense. And uh, you have to, to think about some X2 uh, as well. Uh, you, your X2 interface, it needs to be fast, okay? Okay. In, because you will, you through this interface, mm -hmm. many data are going to, to, to transit and so on. And uh, this has to be fast. Okay, okay, and for E node Bs, it seems to be start topology. Every E node B is connected to e all of the other two E node Bs, but for H E node Bs. I mean, in the specification, one E node B can set up an X2 connection to any E node Bs. M more than one? Means, no. Okay. Well, I mean, it's direct link, but everything is there. Yeah, but here we, for example, the, um, we have just linear connectivity. One, for home E node B, one. Home E node B is connected to only one home E node B. Yeah. But there we seem to be connected with multiple E node B. It, it is on purpose or it's just for explaining? I mean, just the scheme. I mean, usually, yes. What, uh, I mean, your E node B can set up X2 connection with, uh, to different E node Bs. Uh, the, the same goes from the for, for the E node B. But those has to be, let's say, they, they must share the same CSG. Mm -hmm. or have some kind of special status, let's say they are open or hybrid. Because okay. if you consider that you have a CSG there mm -hmm. and a different one there, then this mm -hmm. to interface has no meaning at all. Okay. Unless you're doing some kind of, let's say, interference mitigation stuff and so on. But I mean, that this is not the priority uh, right now mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to okay. address this issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions?
Oh, okay, and then a final recall on, on the different uh, access policy that we've that you've got the closed, the hybrid, and the and the open. But the thing is that you have to to to, to keep this architecture in, in, in mind. So X2 interface between inode bees and the home inode bees may have X2 interface, but they rely on S1 uh, more than uh, uh, X2 usually. So just an overview on the IC-IC uh, uh, technique, intercell interference coordination. In release 8.9, so we're talking about LTE, not LTE advanced, so meaning just one, uh, one carrier. Um, the solutions that were proposed uh, to, to do this IC-IC and that are standardized uh, are, let's say, uh, frequency domain solutions. And they aim to provide protection on the uh, data channel, okay? And you, th this is done, so this is the release uh, eight, nine architecture, and this is done through, uh, to, um, by exchanging some indicators through the X2 interface. So that means that only macro cell and pico cell can use uh, these uh, mechanism, these indicators uh, when they are release eight, release nine compliant. And to, uh, let's say, we, you've got the, interf uh, the uplink interference management. So you've got two uh, different indicators. Um, this is how uh, you, you, you've got the uh, SCFDMA access for the LT uplink. Uh, I won't go back to, to that unless there, there are some questions, and I think that you saw that uh, yesterday. But basically, the ID is that uh, you've got the overload indicator. Th that means that uh, one in of B will report its level of interference on each resource block. So I'm saying that you're all aware with what a resource block is. This is a granularity. This is the lowest granularity that you can address on the, uh, on the OFDMA um, access. And one in of B will report its level of interference. It's either low, medium, or high on each of these resource blocks. So this is a reactive process. It just uh, sniffs this uplink uh, bound, see if it receives too much interference on, let's say, a set of resource blocks, and send this, uh, these indicators, low, high, medium, for all resource blocks to uh, the neighboring uh, um, uh, inode bees, let it be macro cell or pico cell. Then you've got what, we, what, what is called the high interference indicator, well, it's a bit different. This is not a reactive process. This is a proactive process. Basically, the space station will say, OK, I will send one bit per resource block. So it's a bitmap. And it will indicate that it's going, um, it's going if it, it, I mean, it, it indicates uh, that cell edge users will be on these resource blocks. So basically, uh, we're going to say, OK, uh, this resource block, I'm, go I, I'm going to put cell edge users so uh, this is some kind of user we have to protect. To protect. So uh, I'm uh, sending that, broadcasting that through X2 interface to other neighboring uh, inode bees, and then they do whatever they want with that information. But at least I've warned them that they're going to be, uh, I'm going really to have, uh, to, to, to have resource blocks that are really uh, dedicated to select users. Okay. And this, this, is, this is a continuous process? Overload indicator is always transmitted? When an X2, connect, X2 connection is set up, you can, uh, I mean, you can decide uh, how many times you want to uh, transmit that. The thing is that in 3GPP, you're just specifying uh, means, tools. Okay. And then it's up to you to do what you want with, that, with, with those tools, because it's all intellectual property stuff and so on. I mean, they just say, okay, in release eight, nine, you've got that, you've got that. Mm -hmm. Okay, do whatever you want with, uh, with those. Okay, uh, this is just a requir requirement. I mean, this is th those are requirements. If you want to say, okay, I'm supporting X2 interface, release eight, release nine, I need to have a way to <coughs> set up an X2 connection to enable and then to send up those indicators for the uplink, for instance. But I'm trying to understand the purpose of this low indicator. Means why to send the indicator saying that there's low interference? It could be taken as default, and we could save from one bit. 
well, the, why the, the, did they make this the kind of distinction? It could have been just uh, low high. Yes, means medium or high means if there is low indicator means there the, the, the could be no need to I mean, transmit. Yeah. I mean, th those are just quantification. The more uh, you bring, the more uh, degrees of freedom you've got. Okay. Okay. I mean, this will uh, also affect all your scheduling that you developed in the in of these. Yeah. Yes, but with medium or high, we could have just one bit, yeah? yeah. And uh, uh, by sending low, we are not providing any information. Means it could be taken as a default scenario. Well, but this is, uh, let, let, mm, yeah, yeah. But this is some kind of, let's say, uh, a reactive process. I mean, I'm sensing my, unveil, my uh, surrounding, and mm -hmm. then I say, OK, on those, I'm OK. On those, it depends. On those one, I'm really suffering. Okay. So this gives this level of freedom. I mean, mm -hmm. okay. But yeah. Mm. So this is for the uplink, and in uh, release eight nine, you've got something else in the other way. In the downlink, you've got this uh, RNTP indicator, uh, relative narrowband transmit power, where. In fact, the inode bees will just say per resource block what is going to be its uh, transmit power. Okay, so this is as well some kind of proactive process, and it enables all this uh, frequency partitioning scheme. Uh, let's say one cell can advertise that okay, it's going to transmit a lot of power in uh, this uh, in this part of the spectrum in this lower part, the second one in the uh, medium uh, part of the spectrum, and the third one in the high part on the spectrum. And then it enables some kind of dynamic frequency partitioning schemes. So you've got the hard frequency reuse, where you just split. Or you, you make orthogonality. Orthogonality is interference. Uh, you, I mean, it's a friend of interference. You lower the interference with orthogonality, but you lower your uh, data rate and so on. You've got other schemes that are uh, fractional frequency reuse schemes, where, in fact, you just make some kind of distinction, as Zubin mentioned. Uh, in LT, you want to protect the sellage users. Or, basically, the ITUA requirements uh, that have put some kind of stress on this sellage uh, minimum uh, spectral efficiency that you, you have to uh, provide to those kind of users. Because, of course, with LTA, with this hundred of megahertz and so on, you've got high peak uh, data rates. But at the end of the day, uh, you don't have that on your mobile phone. Uh, you're just one user among others. And you try to, let's say, put a, a more stress on the sellage users. So the idea of the fractional frequency reuse is to, um, I, I will go back uh, on that uh, earlier, but just to have the main idea is that, okay, you've got your central users, that are close to the base station, so they, they, they've got good uh, radio uh, conditions. They, they, in three different cells, they may share the same spectrum, since due to I mean, geometrical factors, uh, they won't be that much interfered. And then for the sellage users, uh, for the fractional frequency reuse, you give them orthogonal uh, uh, part of the spectrum, okay? And for, uh, or you've got the other option, which is the soft frequency reuse, where in fact you, you're using all the bandwidth, but for these sellage users, you're transmitting uh, information or data to them with a higher uh, transmit power. Okay, so basically, you're using all the spectrum there, you're doing some kind of orthogonality. But we'll go back to, to, to that later, uh, later on. But all this, I mean, those are really for uh, data uh, channels because those data channels, we have got some kind of control on where to put, uh, where to allocate resources to one user, while for the control channels, it's a bit more difficult. You don't have this flexibility. I mean, uh, as um, I mentioned this morning, these uh, control channels are depending on your uh, physical cell ID and so on, so uh, you don't have this flexibility. The only flexibility that you've got or you can play with is, for instance, as mentioned, playing with the physical cell ID. But you have to, to keep in mind that you don't have that much of degrees of freedom, especially if you want to, uh, you've got a limited set of uh, physical cell ID, okay? 
And if you want to address the, uh, let's say, reference signal interference, the cell reference signal interference, you, those ones are shifting with a modulo 6 for just one antenna port, meaning that when you have those nice uh, macro base station with several antennas, let's say two antennas, it's just enough, that, or, or four, then you don't have this modulo 6 flexibility, but it's a, mod, a modulo 3. So this limits a bit uh, all, the, all that. But fortunately, uh, cell reference signals are known signals. So we can put a stress on the UE uh, to, to use advanced uh, receive, uh, receivers. But I mean, this is what's, going, uh, what's being discussed uh, uh, now. But OK, so far, re release 8 and 9 for ICIC, it was really for uh, data channel protections and those way um, frequency uh, domain solutions. Okay. Then we, with release 10, uh, we, we, we've got what we, we, we call the enhanced uh, ICIC. So you'll see this e ICIC quite often uh, if you're familiar with heter heterogeneous networks, the ethnet. And basically, this uh, EICIC it targets those kind of uh, uh, deployment, those ethnets. Um, um, main of these ICIC means that are provided, those are time domain solutions, and it's meant to protect uh, the uh, control channel this time. So uh, we've got still some information that are exchanged through X2 interface. So we've got uh, this E node B, E node B, X2 interface. We've got as well X2, X2 interface. So when we're going to, to exchange information through X2 interface, basically we're just saying that, okay, this will be some kind of macro PICO uh, scenarios, okay? No FEMTO because FEMTO cannot have X2 connections toward uh, a macro or a, or a PICO or a macro, okay? So this is uh, X2 interface. And to, to encompass femto cells into those uh, headnet uh, scenarios, um, then we can, ha we can rely on, let's say, static or semi-static configurations. Uh, what you've got to know, and I think that there will, uh, I don't know if you've seen already the architecture uh, so far or not, but uh, a, a home he not be, it has what's called a, an HMS, which is uh, the, the um, an auto configuration server, and it gives, it provides to the to the femto cell some informations on, let's say, uh, the carrier you're allowed to transmit on, uh, your maximum power, and so on. And you can as well exchange information using the TRO69 protocol, uh, which is a protocol coming from the broadband forum, uh, really targeted to uh, CP, uh, customer premise equipment, uh, and you will use this protocol. To have, let's say, some, to define some kind of semi-static configurations, and um, to, to, to provide information to the uh, to, to the femto cell. And uh, despite being a release ten uh, mechanism, uh, the focus is only on non-carrier aggregation uh, deployment. I mean, just have one uh, carrier. Uh, this is the the, the ID. So what we've got, we've got the downing uh, power control. Basically, this targets the femtocell, where uh, the power of the femtocell is adjusted based on the uh, surrounding. And, uh, measurements are performed in the downlink and in the uplink. And to do that, you, you need to have, uh, let's say, an, a network listen module within the femtocell, which is, let's say, uh, a piece of hardware which is doing the same measurements as a UE will, will do. Okay. You, you have to know that um, in, the, in the specifications, the femto cell is still uh, a base station. So it has some kind of measurements that it has to do, it has to perform, but not all measurements. I mean, you, the, the, fem, the, the base station could only measure, uh, let's say, the uh, specific power coming from, a, from a, another, fem, uh, another base station, but it cannot go uh, that far. It cannot do, do the same measurements as a UE. It's not specified. But operators, when they order you a femto cell, they say, OK, I want that. I want that feature. So you have to implement that. And uh, OK, the, 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 the ID, it's not, 
expressly, I mean, this is not this expression that you may find in the specifications, but it's the same. Uh, you, you will have that, that, that you will find it's something that, okay, my new trans, uh, I'm doing some kind of sniffing. Okay, my femtocell is doing sniffing. It measures a power coming from, let's say, uh, the uh, dominant uh, macro cell uh, base station. Okay. And then I'm just correcting it with some kind of parameters. Okay, which will, let's say, for instance, this parameter will define my uh, coverage radius. Okay, and I'm doing that in the range of the transmit power that a femtocell can uh, support. So I'm sniffing the macrocell environment, and I'm ad adapting just my power to protect, basically, the macrocell uh, the macrocell user that may come in the vicinity of this uh, femtocell. The idea is to keep the uh, coverage area of the femtocell. Uh, let's say close to the femto users, but not uh, going too far uh, away. If you go back to the specification of femto cell, you know uh, you, s you can see that a max, uh, let's say a femto cell can transmit at maximum power. Of, you think it's 23 dBm or 20, uh, 23 dBm when you've got just one antenna, and 20 dBm per antenna if you've got two transmit antennas. But when you do, when you transmit with that much power, I mean, you're just disturbing too much the the the, the macro cell network, especially if you're in a residential uh, scenario. I mean, just some kind, of just to, okay. I want the femto just for myself, covering my house or my apartment. So, usually you need less much power than that. It's around zero dBm, but okay. Those are just uh, average number. So downlink po uh, power control has been introduced, um, and we see some kind of evaluation uh, after that. Um, what's uh, new as well um, is what uh, Zubin mentioned, the uh, almost blank subframe uh, pattern. I mean, the idea is just, OK, uh, on certain subframe, I will just mute, OK? I will just mute uh, so that the, the aggressor cell will just mute its transmission, and the victim cells will be able to, uh, let's say, uh, transmit normally. And the users may be able to, um, well, have access to the network and so on. But uh, as mentioned, there are some issues with the mobile that needs to be aware of these patterns and so on. And this, those are uh, current discussions. But uh, at least pattern were, patterns were defined. You have a question? No? Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> But you've got patterns that are defined and patterns that have some kind of, let's say, periodicity because you know that uh, periodically on the downlink some uh, broadcast channels are transmitted and you want to protect those ones, the PSS, the SSS, the B, uh, uh, and so on. And the thing is that uh, these, those patterns, they are uh, dynamically transferred through the X2 interface. So we are just talking about the macro PICO scenario. And in such a case, in such case, I mean, the aggressor is the macro cell, and the victim is the pico cell. Why? And the opposite way, when you when you trying to apply almost blank subframe to femto cells, then it's the other way around. I mean, the aggressor is the femto cell, and the victim is the macro cell, and those patterns are semi-statically uh, broadcasted. I mean, they they they're using the uh, what, what we call OAM, operations administration and management. This is the uh, 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 the uh, configuration server that we uh, saw so just in the release 10 uh, architecture, the, this H HMS uh, stuff. So, um, with almost blocks, uh, uh, with ABS frame, of course, you just transmit those uh, cell reference signals that may, that, that may be uh, some kind of, uh, that may give, uh, in, that may give interference, but those signals, I mean, they are known. They are part of a special uh, sequences. Uh, I think it shows that off, but I'm not sure about that uh, right now. But I, can uh, I can check. But anyway, uh, those are known sequences, meaning that we can put intelligence on the receiver side. But putting intelligence on the receiver side, I mean, it's always not that. Uh, it consumes battery, OK? And in, uh, you, you may, let's say, use let's, uh, interference cancellation mechanism. You know what you you know the, those interf uh, you know that okay, you know what uh, is the real structure of the of this CRS. You can suppress them at the receiver. 
but you cannot specify in 3GPP, I'm going to use interference cancellation. No, you, you're only going to specify requirements. With this level of SINR, I can decode. So this is a bit, uh, I mean, this is the, 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 the game. Uh, at the end of the day, on the, three, on the 3GPP side, you cannot specify uh, receive techniques or receive uh, more specific receive techniques. And you know, what you've got as well is the what's called the cell range extension. Uh, I mean, it tar th this kind of thing targets especially uh, the hotspot scenario on the P meaning the the uh, Pico cell uh, deployment, where in fact the Pico cell is going to broadcast a bias, uh, and uh, when a UE is c close to the to the fem to, to the Pico cell, uh, it reads the uh, system information which is broad broadcasted by these Pico cells, and it's doing its measurements to know okay if I was in idle mode I was camping on this macro cell should I go on should I go and camp on this Pico cell instead because it offers a, a better uh, let's say uh, receive power. But uh, this mechanism, to do that, there is an offset which is broadcasted. And if you just modify this offset, in fact, you can tell to the UE, okay, stick to the, or camp to the, picos, to the Pico cell, but in fact, its uh, SNR, SINR level will be, uh, will be low, okay? Because you are introduced some kind of bias, of bias and it say, okay, um, I will stick because this is broadcasted this way, but uh, I'm experiencing, experiencing um, a lot of interference and this is where uh, to cope with that uh, you need uh, advanced your receiver okay uh, let's for, for instance interference cancellation receiver and so on yep the the the, I, the idea of uh, this cell rate extension is uh, in a hotspot situation you want to get to, 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 you want that the people that are connecting to this hotspot stay on this uh, mm -hmm. Pico cell and do not, let's say, overload or yeah. do whatever you want on the macro network. They have to stay on the Pico to offload the macro network, which covers a greater so area. Bias towards the so it's a bias towards, I mean, it's the bias to, uh, broadcasted by the, uh, fem by the Pico cell. And it's say, uh, for instance, you need uh, X dB, you, you need to have, uh, let's say, X dBm. Uh, to uh, come on, uh, on on this Pico cell, and then you will just add a bias, and you will say, okay, you need X yeah. minus that. You need less power to come on this Pico cell. Mm -hmm. This is meant to st stuck people or to, to stick people uh, into this area. Okay, so this is some kind of a flow, but you need uh, advanced receivers. And all that are for let's uh, non-carrier aggregation uh, system. Uh, any questions so far? No? So in release 11, I mean, the current discussion that, uh, that are occurring in 3GPP, uh, you've got, uh, let's say, two uh, different approach. You've got the further enhanced IC, IC for non-CA-based uh, uh, deployment, meaning that you just enhancing a bit further what's existing, but f just for the uh, non cia based de de uh, deployment. So there are proposals that, are, uh, that you can, I, mean, I don't know if you're following the 3GPP discussions. If not, you can. I encourage you to follow those uh, RAN 1, RAN 4 as well, uh, uh, ref uh, reflector. Just, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's almost free. And it's a source of information but it's a source of disturbing for your mailbox because every month you've got hundreds of megas that are on, on your box. But um, apart from that, you, you, you will see these kind of discussions occurring on those various topics, and you've got this FEIC IC uh, stuff where there is some kind of things at the, uh, th there are some proposal at the uh, transmitter side, let's say, where we say, okay, we will combine the almost blank subframe uh, pattern that we've got, but we will add power control on top of that, just to reduce the complexity or the need to decode the cell reference signal uh, from the uh, blanking uh, subframe that are still there. 
And of course, you've got uh, as well this uh, advanced UE uh, stuff, advanced U UE receiver stuff that are uh, discussed and bring back uh, to the table, cancellation, and discard of non signal, and so on. And what's new is that you've got, okay, the ICIC, but this time for carrier aggregation based scenario. So uh, I won't go back to the carrier aggregation, but okay, you've got, I think mm, Zubin made, mm, made it clear how it's working. At maximum, you've got five component carriers. And um, for these component carriers, you've got one uh, per user, which is defined, which is the primary component carriers, which will uh, let's say, to have this, uh, uh, the control information telling you where your data are located in the other component carriers. And those, compon these, those other component carriers are called uh, second uh, component carriers, second cells. And you will find, uh, uh, and what it's uh, worth noting is that cross scheduling is possible, meaning that you, you can have on one component carrier uh, controls that tells you, okay, you will have your data on the same compo component carriers, but as well on the second compo on the second one component carriers and so on. So uh, the, the 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 idea is that, okay, that is just what what, what I just told is that the pr primary uh, cell is carrying the control and or data information, while second cell are carrying the data, and the idea is to 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 check or to see how we can distribute this component. Uh, these primary cells, these uh, secondary cells, uh, when we've got a carrier aggregation uh, system. Because what you've got to uh, remember is that uh, those cells, primary and secondary, those concepts, they are per user. Okay, this is not for one base station, I've got one primary cell. No, no, this is for these users, this is my primary cell. So the ID is um, what has been discussed now. Okay, if I've got um, a macro user which is close to the to the base station, to the macro base station, okay, I can have my control uh, on uh, the component carrier one or two, okay, and my data on one or two doesn't matter. But um, when I'm when I'm uh, close to let's say uh, uh, a Pico cell, then I will just have for this macro user which is close to the Pico cell my control on a given component carriers and my data on uh, F1 or, or, or F2. And for the Pico users, uh, we have the opposite, to just protect the control channels just as uh, we saw this morning. I mean, the idea is really to protect the control channels because without the control, you don't have the data. <laughs> then if you have protected the, con the control, then okay, you can have a look at the data how you can protect them again. But this is the ID. Uh, any questions? No? OK. So um, all of those are, um, let's say, the, 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 the mechanisms that are discussed or that has be, uh, have been discussed in 3GPP uh, those years. And. Uh, The cell selection procedure takes into account only the SINR, or does it take into account the load as well? Yeah, load I means the traffic load. For example, uh, the uh, Pico cell might provide, say, uh, better SINR some, for somehow, but uh, it may be loaded. So is it CGP? Are, uh, yeah, okay. uh, I mean, those are under discussion. Those are just proposals. Okay, the idea will be to do that, to do that. Okay, but of course you've got more than that. Uh, you've got the, 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 the cell load, you've got uh, all this kind of stuff that you may, uh, that you may uh, put on top of this mechanism. This mechanism just tell you, okay, your control will be, let's say, orthogonal, so you won't have any problem with that. Mm -hmm. But then if you decide to accept the uh, new users and so on, I mean, it's up to, 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 to you to maybe as well use the cell reg extension and so on, play with that. Or you mm -hmm. can just deny an access to, mm -hmm. uh, to one UE. But uh, when the uh, UE is idle, you cannot deny any access. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay? The, the, the femtocell can, or this, the base station. I mean, uh, what you have to know is that a UE, when he's in idle mode, and he decided to come on the base station, it does not tell the base station, uh, okay, I'm here. It only tells that if, 
I don't know, you've got your macro cell network, which is divided in small uh, tracking area. Okay? And when you're changing tracking areas, here the mobile has to advertise not the base station, but the core network. Okay, I've changed my tracking area, I'm here. Why? Because if you want to receive a call, the core network needs to know where you are. Not necessarily uh, which base station is serving you, because in idle you do not advertise that. Mm -hmm but where you are, in which tracking area, and then it will uh, send information to those base stations covering this tracking area to uh, do the paging. Mm -hmm. But in active mode, m when a base station is... When uh, you're in connected mode, mm. then of course, you're there, you're there, you're just doing your measurements, and you just say, okay, uh, oh, this uh, base station is uh, better suited to my... Uh, SINR quality and so on and then this is always the, be the, the your saving base station which will trigger the handover never the, the UE the, the base stations will contact the, uh, the, 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 ta the target base station this and we tell him okay uh, handover is needed hmm. and then uh, these uh, target base stations uh, if it's overloaded it can say okay no no Mm -hmm. uh, you won't be able, no, no, I cannot accept you. Okay. Uh, all those are, uh, the handover is always, um, let's say, controlled by the base stations, never by the UE. It's only when you, uh, in active mode, I mean, connected mode, but in idle mode, uh, the UE just can't and never uh, uh, tell the uh, base stations, uh, at least uh, when it stays in the same tracking area. No, no, more, no, no more questions? Okay. So uh, we've got many of mechanisms uh, to deal with interference. And uh, how can we evaluate them? Of course, we, 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 could, we, we could rely on link level simulations. But in the base case, because in link level simulations, you're really trans, uh, simulating everything. Your, your uh, bit uh, generations, your encoding. Uh, on, in the case of uh, LTE, it's turbo encoding. Uh, with code, words, uh, code block segmentation and so on. Then you've got the modulations, uh, the mapping, and the OFDM stuff, the channel, and, uh, uh, and this uh, makes uh, the link level simulations adapt to, let's say, a point to point, or in the base case, point to multi point uh, situation scenario, multi uh, let's say some kind of multi user scenario, but really one base station and some users. Not, uh, not uh, a large scale. Uh, uh, evaluations and that's where uh, system level uh, enters the the arena to provide you a large scale vision of your algorithms how they do how they uh, how they operate so uh, I'm going just to uh, give uh, the uh, let's say classical evaluation methodology uh, do you have any ID on system level simulations have, you, have some of you already done some uh, no, yes, just write the end and I know, uh, okay, so I think it will be worth uh, for uh, the, the, the others. So what you have to know is that these system level simulations, they allow uh, large scale representations, meaning uh, several base stations and attached to, to, to them several users, okay? And uh, it aims at evaluating all your uh, system performance, meaning that you can uh, evaluate radio resource management uh, algorithms, uh, interference mitigation techniques, uh, coverage estimation, and so on. And based on those uh, evaluations, you can gather statistics, because basically system level simulations are based on Monte Carlo approach. You can derive some kind of uh, mathematical framework and so on to avoid those Monte Carlo approach, but at the end of the day, in 3GPP, for instance, uh, Monte Carlo approach. Uh, this is where you've got uh, your results. So you, you then, uh, based from that, you can gather many statistics. Let's say, for instance, the throughput, the fairness, uh, how many times the UE has received data. All, all this is based on your uh, scheduling policy that you have implemented. So you can check your scheduling policy. You know that you've got three families of scheduling algorithms, the max uh, C over I, I don't know, the round robin, where you just schedule users uh, independent of their uh, radio channel quality. Uh, 
uh, and you've got some kind of proportional fairness stuff that tries to, let's say, um, be a trade-off between the uh, amount of data you received and your quality. Uh, you can measure as well selectivity. This is um, of interest for femtocells, for instance. And of course, you can apply realistic traffic on top of that. Uh, for instance, you cannot then uh, estimate your frame packet error of uh, all statistics that, you, that are related to traffic, for instance, the, the jitter uh, or the frame packet acknowledgement time and so on. And uh, basically, the structure that you may, f the, the, the evaluation methodology, uh, either you're looking at 3GPP, 3GPP2, uh, IEEE uh, uh, 802.16M, uh, well, or WiMAX, you have always this kind of same methodology. You've got the system part, where you've got what is called a static uh, construction, where you will build your network, you will deploy your mobile, and then you will compute your long-term parameters, your long-term parameters and compare the path loss, okay, basically, the antenna gains, uh, because you've got uh, some antennas, especially for the macro cell network, which, are, uh, which have a, a, a privileged direction, a both side, and shadowing, of course. And those, this is the static. Then you enter the dynamic path, where you've got, let's say, some kind of loop loop based on the, uh, on, uh, on the subframe uh, granularity, on TTI granularity, where you compute all your uh, short-term uh, stuff, meaning uh, basically the fast fading. Okay? Here you just have the, your fast fading. Okay? Based on that, you will have this, uh, what's called the physical layer abstraction, because other, as I told you, you cannot, uh, with uh, this network deployment, I mean, the idea of to, to have many base stations, many users uh, do the link simulations. Uh, so you just use an abstraction. And usually, uh, I'll, go, I'll talk to that uh, later, you can use lookup tables, which gives you, for instance, once you have computed one values, the SINR, uh, the block error rate of your radio frame. Or you can use a more uh, direct approach, which is, for instance, the truncated chain unbound, which will use, uh, which will, uh, from the SINR, gives you uh, the spectral efficiency. Quite, uh, uh, it's quite straightforward. And then you've got this loop, okay? You've got all that. Uh, you can report here the CQI and so on, and then you're doing your scheduling, and you're, uh, you can as well simulate the A uh, HRQ process and so on. And this loop, and, uh, during sufficient uh, times, you can gather statistics, uh, let's say throughput, coverage, and so on, for a given scenario, a given deployment. Then you can redraw uh, or redraw re uh, all the, the, the network stuff and do the same again. And this is the Monte Carlo approach. And at the end, you gather statistics that you uh, represent most of the time uh, using a, a CDF. Those are the curves you, you saw this morning, for instance. So uh, regarding the um, network deployment, uh, for the macro cell, there is a 2D hexagonal uh, layout uh, where we talk about a, a central cell. Okay. Um, usually, you've got a base station uh, at, this, uh, at this location, which covers three sectors. Uh, okay. uh, so basically, you've got three cells. Okay. But they are the same base station is covering the three cells. You've got the first tier, which are six, uh, base sta six seats uh, surrounding uh, your central one. And uh, with that, you, 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 you have now seven seats, 21 cells. Okay? And you have to keep that value in, in mind, because for femtocell simulations, we usually use uh, this layout instead of the uh, traditional one, which is you, you add a second tier with 12 uh, seats. And uh, this leads to a total of uh, 57 cells. Okay, so uh, this is the let's see, hexagonal layout, this uh, traditional layout that you've got. In each point, you've got uh, a seat. Each seat is taking care of one sec uh, of three sectors, and each sector is a cell. Okay, so it's seen as a different. Uh, so in terms of interference sure that when you're here, you see a lot of interference coming from those 
uh, from the first tier, from the second tier, and so on. But when you're, uh, uh, let's say, on the second tier, then if you just com uh, compute the interference mm, just this way, uh, you will have less interference because due to the geometrical uh, stuff, if you just if you're there and you comp and you see who is going really to interfere you, you just have those uh, cells. Or so the idea is to uh, combat this edge effect by using wraparound. Wraparound is just, OK, uh, I've got my cluster, my first cluster, and I will duplicate this one all around. OK? So this allows to uh, just, uh, to, to s this allows that every user there will see an equivalent amount of interfering, uh, of interferers. Uh, this is the ID. And wraparound is done only uh, using a, a mathematical trick when you're computing the distance. And this avoids you to just have, let's say, because uh, uh, what was done previously, for instance, is that you can, okay, drop a, uh, all the, keep, uh, stick with that and gather uh, results only for the central cell, for instance. But when you're doing, but when you're doing dealing with, let's say, femtocell stuff and so on, they are deployed a bit everywhere. You not really, you do not guarantee that you you will have uh, cells at the exact positions or or this kind of stuff. So relying on wraparound, uh, okay, it's a bit more complicated, but you've got uh, the the overall picture. And it's complicated only with, I mean, it's just a mathematical trick to when you are computing your distance and so on. You can find everything on the. I think Femtoform white paper has uh, got, uh, got it right. Uh, the OVM A1, you take a look at the annex and you have these equations uh, on how to, to, to use wraparound. And then when you've got this network, then you can compute, uh, you can compute the long-term parameters. So if we consider that we've got a point P, okay, which is at a distance R from, uh, from a, a seat or a base station, and which is doing uh, a, an angle th theta uh, with the main direction of your cell, then you can, let's say, uh, with this the geometrical stuff, you can derive the long-term parameters. You can derive the path loss. For instance, at 2 gigahertz, uh, the path loss is given this way. Uh, so th this is in dB, and you can add optional wall attenuations. So it makes sense when you are going to talk about femtocells to, to have this wall attenuations. You can derive the antenna gain. Uh, usually your point, if it's a, a mobile, you assume that you've got an omni uh, uh, antenna pattern because when you've got your phone, you do not really target your uh, base station to know, okay, I've got a better reception this way or, or this way around. And this is some kind of uh, usual pattern, 2D pattern that you've got uh, for the base station, for the macro cell base station. Okay. For a femtocell, we as well assume that we've got omni, because your femtocell, you do not have any control on how it's going to be placed by your users, by the users that is going to, to buy your femtocell. So it's an omni uh, diagram as well. Uh, of course, you may have some refinement with the tilt, uh, and then you're entering the, the 3D pattern, but it's an equation which is similar to this one. And of course, you've got this shadowing, because up to now, uh, there, there, there were uh, no random stuff at all. Once you have put all your uh, base stations, all your users, I mean, it was fixed. The antenna gain, the path loss. And the shadowing, it's some kind of random variable. It's a log normal one, which represents, let's say, the obstacle that you may have between your base stations <coughs> And your uh, and your mobile and your point, and uh, there are some correlations, especially true for the uh, uh, macro cell, uh, meaning that okay, uh, you've got a correlation of one if you are considering sectors or cells from the same site, because basically when you've got two points, uh, independent of the sector that you are uh, considering, uh, the obstacle between the, those two will be the same, okay, and the correlation of 0.5 between uh, sectors or cells from different sites. Well, this is the, the, ba the basic assumptions. And uh, with that, you can compute the... the does this correlation coefficients come from any specifications? Otherwise, make, uh, I you mean can... You take a look at the, uh, any, any evaluation methodology. 
um, being it uh, from 3GPP, from my from my Max, from IEEE 1102, uh, 802, because M. You have some this kind of correlate. Uh, I mean, those are basic assumptions. This is the uh, let's say this, those are your assumptions. Okay. Uh, those, these, those are how you compute cor uh, shadowing, and there's optional stuff is um, when you just uh, talk about auto correlations because with this kind of approach, I've got one be one uh, base station. I'm here. I've got. I'm experiencing a, a given shadowing. And if I've got, uh, let's say, a friend just yeah. uh, near, near, uh, near me, he won't have this. Usually, its shadowing will be independent. This is the simplest way to mm. compute shadowing. Mm. Uh, but, mm, I mean, uh, if you uh, just think about, I mean, mm. we experience some kind of equivalent shadowing. Mm. And uh, this is, for instance, captured in, uh, in the the evaluation methodology document from uh, IEEE802.16M where they introduce a two degrees where the spacing between your point uh, mm. defines the auto, the auto correlation. So what we assume is that for a urban environment uh, you are around 15 meters, uh, yeah, 15 meters yeah. for macro cell and 3 meters for fetal cell. Yeah, but my question is, um, this is cross-correlation and that is auto-correlation. Yeah, yes. but for cross-correlation, people are using that. But there are some models in literature which you can give you based on angular sp spacing the, between um, base station and distance, relative distance between wha base what station. What is true is that uh, once um, when you're taking a look at how uh, the uh, path mm, fading mm. coefficients are generated, mm, yeah. uh, take for example, the sp special mm. channel uh, the SCM channel, oh, yeah, the minor right. channel. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when you uh, generating your shadowing, you're mm -hmm. generating as well your angle spread and delay spread. And all of them are correlated, so you are adding more complexity to your to your uh, shadowing mm -hmm. generation. But you've got a better a better picture on how mm -hmm. your uh, how this affects your uh, fast fading coefficients. And uh, okay, but this is just a practical. Static case. This is what uh, we usually okay. do. It's for simplicity. Otherwise, uh, there is exactly a more right. sophisticated for when you, model. When you're going with uh, fast fading, you still have those coefficients, but on top of that, your angle spread and daily spread and so on, they are correlated to the coefficients you generated. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just the, um, how you how you have the the, the SM, I Because think this will you. this will make life very easy. Actually, it means we spend <laughs> a yeah. lot of time in modeling shadowing and and uh, these assumptions could save us. <laughs> this is just to have, let's say, a common basis so that when you come with a, uh, an interference algorithm uh, or so when you're doing some kind of performance evaluation, mm. let's say a MIMO scheme and so on, you can compare with uh, or other people and have a simple model to, uh, okay. that so that you can, uh, you're not uh, forced to, to put a lot of effort to uh, have a common basis okay. and then do this comparison. Okay, thank you. So with all those parameters, uh, at, a, uh, at a given point, we can compute the receive power coming from a base station, which will be its transmit power plus the gain, the antenna gain that we've got, that may encompass as well body loss. Usually they are, uh, they are uh, put with the, the antenna gain and so on. And you just take out uh, the, sh the path loss and the shadowing. So once we, you have defined uh, your uh, uh, serving cell, you are, you, you are able to, to compute the SINR, or uh, call as well the G factor, the geometrical uh, factor, because it relies on geometry, where you've got your uh, receive, the, the power from your uh, serving base stations, and you just sum up uh, all the interference plus the thermal noise, which depends on your uh, bandwidth and, and so on. But basically this G factor, call SINR, or whatever you want, this is the static uh, that you uh, just check. And that, when you'd want to plot it, can give you some kind of nice picture that maybe uh, you, you are friend with. This is when you do not have any shadowing and without wraparound. So here you see the edge effect that I was mentioning. Okay. And without shadowing, okay, you, you uh, I mean, you can, uh, you don't have any randomness on, on that. 
everything is fixed because the antenna gains and the pass loss are fixed once you, you if you do not put any shadowing and here this is the same pictures when you just incorporate the um, shadowing okay plus the wrap around so you don't have any uh, edge effect uh, anymore but uh, if you take a look uh, you you maybe close it maybe no uh, I don't know if on the if you can see it here, but you, can, you, you see here some kind of grid uh, because you, you will see this 50 meters autocorrelation stuff uh, because here we implemented uh, what uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this gives you, uh, okay, you can evaluate a G factor anywhere. So what you're going to do is not evaluate it anywhere because of the shadowing. You want to just drop some kind of users, a uh, given number of users, compute you the, the G factor for those users and drop again. This is the Monte Carlo approach. This is what you're going to do for the macro center. This is the basic stuff. And okay, uh, then you, you've got this. You, you, may you may have this kind of figures when you just put colors to where, be, where the user are attached to, to each cell. Any questions so far for the system uh, level evaluation? No? And then uh, on top of that uh, comes the uh, femtocell. And uh, what we've got there is that we've got two U-band models that are defined. And that Zubin mentioned this morning, you've got the famous dual stripe, where in fact you've got two stripes of 20 blocks. OK, those, those are there. And you have to see that in, uh, let's say, 3D, because you've got six floors, up to six floors. Uh, this is specified in the tier 36. Uh, 814. And uh, the path loss is given uh, with these equations, where in fact, uh, okay, you've got a common path loss. Uh, if you're in the same stripe, okay, if your base station is there and your mobile is there, you're just using this part of the uh, this path loss. And this one, uh, if you're familiar with, but I'm not sure, <laughs> this is the free space loss uh, at 2 gigahertz. Okay, this is the free space loss. And to, 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 put, the, the, to put a bit more uh, uh, attenuation or realistic uh, propagation on top of that, you will just count the number of internal walls that are separating your base station from your uh, point. So this is the, uh, P. P represents the number of internal walls that you will have to cross. And Q represents the number of external walls that you will have to cross. So Basi uh, usually, for uh, external walls, there is something like 10 or 20 dB of attenuations. And for internal walls, it's around 5 or 10 dB. It really depends. Um, and you've got this, um, this term, which uh, in is a function of the distance, but the just the indoor distance, and which represents because here this is uh, an apartment, but usually you don't have an apartment without internal internal walls. I mean, you do, you have your rooms and so on, uh, unless you I don't know don't like walls or so on. And this is some kind of this factor represents the kind of small walls that you have to cross or the rooms that you have to cross. Okay. Oh, I don't remember exactly, but it's assuming something like a wall every three meters or something like that. Uh, but, but, but okay, it's not really uh, worth uh, re uh, remain, uh, remembering. And of course, uh, we are assuming a shadowing, but uh, of 4 dB of standard deviation. While in the macro cell case, it's usually 8 dB when you don't have this line of sight stuff. Uh, and uh, if you are uh, under 1 meter from your femtocell, there is no shadowing, basically, um, unless you put a door uh, just uh, mm -hmm. uh, there. The thing is that, uh, yeah, and there is a last term that I forgot to mention, which is the last one, where M, in fact, is the uh, difference in terms of flow uh, that you've got with your uh, femto cells and your users that you are considering. So this <laughs> makes the uh, dual stripe model a bit complicated to implement quite frankly, because you have to, if you want to do it properly, you have to, to count every uh, wall that you are going to cross, check if it's an internal or an external wall, 
check again the elevation where your user is and so on, but okay, this is the dual stripe model. So um, since it's a bit complicated, uh, people have just said, okay, uh, let's go for another model, uh, the grid one. The grid is much more easier. You just have one floor, you've got 25 blocks, okay? And uh, okay, those blocks are just here for you to see, okay, those are, uh, those are, uh, are blocks. But uh, at the end of the day, this is how I'm, I'm going to compute my pass loss. Okay, I just have the distance and that's it. I, will do not, I, I, won't, I won't consider the, the walls at all, okay? But to, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the idea would be, okay, if I do not have wall, I will just increase my shadowing standard deviation. So I have got uh, 10 dB of standard deviation instead of four. But this makes uh, the green model, uh, when you're applying it with this pass loss, this makes it uh, a more aggressive femto to femto scenario. And it's not uh, as compartmented, as split as the dual strap. But uh, the dual strap, uh, as I've told you, I mean, this is free space loss, this is a number of folds that you cross, so you could perfectly apply the previous equations to this model. I mean, it will uh, work the same way. But uh, the grid uh, was used in uh, round four, I think, uh, because in round four, they are just more focused on performance evaluations and they do not uh, want to have that, that complicated uh, schemes uh, for the center cells. So uh, at the end of the day, you choose either one or the second um, uh, clusters or uh, models, and you just have a, a, a deployment probability, meaning that in each block you have X uh, a percent chance of having a femtocell or not. And if you have one femtocell, then you will drop users within the same block, with uh, considering a minimum uh, femto user distance of 20 centimeters. For the macro cell, you've got something like 35 meters of minimum distance so that your path loss equations uh, are still uh, uh, correct. But I mean, this gi just gives you a, a scale. I mean, you, we just uh, uh, taking uh, apartment with uh, 10 meters cost 10 meters. I mean, those are quite nice apartment. And all of those uh, were static. I mean, this is just static. Okay, when you enter into the dynamic uh, world of the system level simulations, uh, this is where you've got the fast fading. This is where you've got all those subcarriers. This is where you compute using realistic receiver, let's say MMSC receiver or maximum ratio combining receiver, which gives you for one user, uh, for instance, an, an SINR on each of the subcarriers. So we've got, plen let's, if we consider an LTE system with uh, 10 megahertz, we've got 600 subcarriers. Okay, so we cannot have uh, these 600 subcarriers, these 600 uh, SINRs, and deal with that. No, we use compression. And compression, the idea is to okay, compress. <laughs> so you've got these 600, and you just go to one value that is um, that has a meaning that do not deteriorate your performance when you're doing link, link level simulations. And in terms of compressions, you've got, let's say, the traditional uh, EESM. It is, it, it is an exponential, uh, you're using an, an exponential function to compress that. Uh, the thing is that this compression, uh, it relies on parameters that are dependent on the modulation and coding scheme that you are using. So you have to tune those parameters when you're using the EESM to uh, each uh, modulation and coding schemes that you're going to uh, exploit okay, or to use. And you've got the MIESM, which rely on the mutual information. And when you're using the mutual information as a compression function and you try to tune those parameters, then you see that, in fact, you do not need these parameters because their value are quite close to one. So why uh, people tend to use the mutual uh, information for compression, I mean, it saves the day. Or you can use more uh, hard approach, the YMAX, uh, for instance, methodology, I think they're using the um, capacity. You're using the capacity. But anyway, you're just talking about exponential and then logarithmic to do the compression. 
The thing is that in your compression, you're just applying a function to the, let's say, uh, I should have put the equations, but I thought too much equation is a bit uh, hard to digest. Uh, but at the, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, maybe, maybe I can. Uh, you've got your compression function, OK, uh, yeah, that you're going to apply to, let's say, your SINR. You're going to put a parameters. You're going to sum that on all your subcarriers, for instance, and then do the put the in, uh, use the inverse function and put a parameter. I think you are, well, well, it really depends. Some people tend to use the same parameters. Okay. The thing is that uh, this will be true, and you have to to check a beta or an alpha or a combination combination of both when you're doing EESM. You have to tune those to the modulation and coding scheme that you are using. Okay. Why, why, when you're doing the same, but using, um, instead of using this exponential function, but you use the mutual information, then you do the same, and you see that your beta and your alpha, they are close to one. So you don't really need to, 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 to rely on that. So this is the, uh, let's say, advantage of, uh, uh, of the mutual information compression. But all that is just to go to just one value, the SINR, that you have computed using, let's say, since you are, you've got fast fading, you, are, you, you, you use receivers where you can easily compute the SINR, uh, MMSC, MRC, uh, well, that's it. <laughs> because for the MLD, if you've got something, uh, I'll take it. Um, and uh, what, do you, what do you do when you've got this final SINR, which represents the overall quality uh, that your user is experiencing, uh, that, uh, that you have compute either on all, ooh, sorry, um, either on all the, bomb, uh, the, the sub, uh, all the subcarriers or just the part that you are interested in? You can rely on lookup tables, which give you the blocker rate, the, the SINR for all the MCS, okay? Or you can use what uh, has been mentioned uh, this morning, the truncated channel bound, which gives you directly the spectral uh, efficiency. You just uh, have this, uh, okay, this channel bound, okay, and you just say, okay, I've got uh, a maximum uh, spectral efficiency that I cannot exceed due to, um, uh, let's say, a modulation order. And uh, from that, okay, you will have your spectral efficiency and you can compute everything. So this is the, the idea of the system level simulations and what you can do with that. And what we can do with that is, for instance, evaluate the power control scheme that we saw previously. Okay. So the system will be uh, based on 10 megahertz bandwidth, 2 gigahertz uh, over the carrier frequency. Uh, this is a U-band deployment scenario uh, where the intercity distance is 500 meters. Uh, for femtocells, we tend to use seven seats or, or instead of, nine, uh, of 19 to reduce the, 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 the simulation complexity. And uh, what we decide is to, to do some kind of static evaluation. So we are dropping a lot of users uh, in the macro, and we are ensuring that 35% of them will be in the cluster that will uh, have femtocells uh, within. Uh, okay, those are just a uh, uh, recall of the parameters that we've got. And we, are, we will just, uh, for these simulations, just consider the 5 per 5 grids, which means the aggressive femto to femto model, and assume a 15% deployment uh, probability. And this minimum maximum power will be 10 dBm minus 10 dBm. And when we are uh, computing the CDF, oh, uh, okay, the CDF of the G factor and assuming an independent CIG per femto cell, meaning that uh, when we've got two femto cells close to each other, uh, they cannot, let's say, uh, they, they do not share the same CSG. And, uh, okay, uh, I used to have some dashed curves, but okay, those one are the dashed curves. In red, you've got the macro cell. In blue, you've got the femto cells. And uh, what we saw is that, <coughs> basically, applying power control uh, tends to, um, of course, uh, lower the femto cell user performance because they've got less power, 
but in the same time, it increased the uh, macrocell user uh, performance. So if we just take a look at what we call the outage, the outage is when your uh, G factor, or the SINR, is below a given value, which, say, which tells you that, okay, it won't be possible to uh, connect or to have access to the, uh, to the, uh, to the network. And you just put, consider that this value is, uh, for instance, minus 6 dB. Then when you're doing nothing and you're just ensuring that 35% of your macrocell users are within the grid, you've got 20% uh, 20 20 of your uh, users that are in outage. Okay? And for the femto users, you've got 10% of them which are also in outage because you've got independent CSG and you have chosen this 5x5 uh, five five grid which is the more, most uh, aggressive femto to femto uh, scenario. <coughs> of course, when you're applying power control, this uh, values go, goes down and if you take a look at your average transmit power instead of your 10 dBm that you've got which are fixed for all femtocells then you're more around let's say minus 1 dBm and to have something like okay my, my, uh, I'm, I'm below 10% of outage for my macrocell user but it's still high I mean it's still high this is just to give you a, a, a picture and what you can do as well is okay uh, since you're in the same building you, you have, uh, I mean, you've got the same, let's say, uh, same carrier, so basically you've got the same operator. You can say, okay, all my femto cell will have a common CSG. Just by doing that, of course, you will uh, greatly reduce the femto cell uh, outage because the femto cell user was uh, previously uh, disturbed by other femto cells. Now we can connect to them, so basically you have no more outage and still have equivalent values for the macro cell user uh, outage. And with the same power control, which will lead you to the same uh, values of average power, uh, then you reduce a bit more uh, the, uh, femto, the uh, macro cell user outage. But the increase in femto cell, uh, out, um, since you have re reduced the power, you still uh, increase the femto cell user outage. But it's still uh, below 1%. I mean, it's even below 0.1%, so it's uh, neglectable. And, well, maybe I can skip this. Uh, I, th I think you will have the slide. I'm not sure about that. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, you, so this is just the same scenario, but using the dual stripe, which is more uh, femto to femto fr friendly. And you see that with the uh, outage, which is really low, because you have got all these walls that are protecting all your femtos, even with independent CIG, while, of course, when you go with common CIG, it's far... Uh, far below what we've got previously. And in terms of outage, due to the protection that you've got, because you've got this really low wall modeling and so on, you've got some kind of more realistic model. It's not perfect. I mean, there are plenty of, uh, of room for, uh, to improve it, but you still have this wall modeling which protects you and so on. And then you go back to outages that are below 3%. And those as, uh, are the things that you can do with static uh, simulation to evaluate this femto cell power control. I mean, this is just the basic of power control when you just have this low uh, deployment probability. Of course, when you increase the deployment probability, then you have more femto to femto in interactions, and then you have to take those interactions into consideration when designing your uh, power control algorithm. This is a, those are just, I mean, the classic one just take care of the macro cell, so you can, there is room to improve that. And we've done that in this sense. And of course you can uh, go to, uh, let's say, f uh, evaluation of frequency partitioning uh, schemes and evaluate them uh, in a dynamic way this time. So uh, the classical schemes are the fractional frequency reduce. I'm not sure I'm, go uh, I'm going to, to, to talk about that uh, again, uh, but you're doing for your select users some kind of orthogonal uh, frequencies. You allocate them uh, and you compare that with the soft frequency we use where you boost their power. But uh, what you've got to know is that, okay, these are the principles, but in LTE, uh, you do not split or address the spectrum the way you want. In LTE, you've got what we call the resource block that you are uh, familiar with. The, those are the 12 subcarriers that you are uh, gathering together. 
uh, either continue, continue uh, either they are continuous, or they may be discontinuous. But most of the time, it's continuous. And for instance, for the 10 mega mega megahertz bandwidth, you've got 15 resource blocks that are paired. Uh, resource block group, and usually one resource block group. Uh, what is it? It's three uh, resource blocks. And these resource block group are either group again in, in subband. A subband usually is a set of two resource block groups. And these subband are gathered together into bandwidth parts. Okay? All that has a meaning because when you, do, when you have this spectrum, uh, w w what's happening is that okay, when you want to tell a UE, you will have data on each, on this, on this, this, this resource blocks. You cannot have this bitmap of 50 resource blocks. I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, signaling that you have. So you have to gather and just put uh, together some, some stuff. And um, for instance, the allocation tip zero, which is used in the uh, specification, it it's allows you to have this uh, to to address to give to users any any resource block groups of this uh, set. I mean, anyone. So it's a bitmap. And for 10 megahertz, it's a uh, yeah, uh, 70 uh, bitmap. Okay, and you see that you've got some kind of last subband, last resource block group, which do not have the same uh, th exactly the same size of the others. But you have to to, to 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 keep that in mind because okay, this is how you tell a UE you will have information on that 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 resource block groups. And the thing is that your UE is just reporting you in the base case at this granularity, the subband one, when you're talking about periodic reporting. It just gives you, OK, uh, this, is, uh, I, this is my quality over the whole bandwidth, or this is my quality, uh, let's say, it will report you uh, by shifting for each bandwidth part, which is its best subband. So uh, and you can, let's say, do a periodic reporting and say, OK, I want all the subbands, and so on. And um, just to tell. Uh, to, to have that in mind, okay, you will have for the specific uh, LTE uh, partitioning what we have adapted, what we have chosen for the results that we've got just below. And of course, since the last subband is the smallest one, we've, put, we, we've um, tried to have the dedicated cell edge bands at the beginning of the spectrum. And if we, we, are, if we are comparing uh, fractional frequency reuse, uh, soft frequency reuse, and of course this is the, the reuse one strategy, which is the IFR uh, in, the, in this, well, you see that the, let's say, the, frequen uh, the fractional frequency reuse due to orthogonality well, will give the, be uh, the, the, the highest SINR for the users. So in terms of CDF, uh, this is the one which, is, which will be uh, the, the, the blue one. So for a macro cell layout, you can um, uh, rely on uh, FFR, and on top of that, and I will just put that. Uh, you can put femtocell on top of that. Uh, put on top of the, of this kind of FFR scheme for the macro cell, and just say, okay, for your femtocell, you will only use two subbands for the time being. This is just a scenario. You can use the whole bandwidth, but you can just choose two subbands that you have uh, that you will choose by sniffing, for instance. And those are, uh, again, uh, the dash should have appeared, but uh, anyway, uh, you can evaluate what you've got in terms of, of cell throughput for the, for the CISO case, for the 2 per two, two, two MIMO case, and for the 4 per 4 uh, MIMO case as well. Uh, for the macro cell, and since you have limited your subband uh, to the femto cells, you are reaching, quite, uh, you are reaching a maximum value. And in terms of, uh, so this is for the cell throughput, and in terms of mobile throughput, uh, of course, the femtocell users, since they are, do not really share their access to the uh, others, they've got, let's say, uh, the better uh, throughput, uh, being it on average, or why the other users, even, even with, my, with my most stuff, have to share. Okay, uh, maybe I will stop there. Uh, yeah, I can. Okay. I mean, this is a sum up of what we saw on that. Uh, this was just uh, some kind of introduction to what system level simulations 
can bring to evaluate interference management in such um, interesting scenario as co-channel uh, deployment. Yeah. Any further questions from the audience? You are hungry. No. Well, I ha you know, I'm, it's, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the uh, still very high outage levels onto the macrocell user. I mean, would they tolerate something like 10%, even 2%? No. So, voila, <laughs> how do we go about it? Oh, th those were just classical uh, solutions. Of course, there is room for improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other means, I mean, uh, to reduce that yeah. a bit further. Okay, and so just, this I is... Mean, this is the, the, the code channel stuff. I right. Mean, just do not think about uh, carrier aggregation stuff yes. and so on, but with carrier aggregation, you it see gets that better, you yeah. can play, switch, around. Yeah, play yeah. around. But if you just look at the G factor itself, mm -hmm. it's a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. So you have to incorporate in your poor control mechanism mm -hmm. some kind of networking, that we've done in the field, some kind of more intelligent sensing, right. not only the macro, but the femto right. as well, right. and rely maybe on the user feedback okay. as it was proposed, but in a mm. realistic way, those measurements should come from the femto users because they those are the one connected to the femto system. Okay. Because the trapped macro users won't be able to report anything right. to anyone. Okay. Okay. Uh, but those kind of things can be aided. So of course, one of the conclusions is that there is plenty of room, mm -hmm. plenty of room mm -hmm. to, to improve that mm -hmm. a bit further, and that system level simulation okay. allow you to to test that. To test that. Yes. All right. Okay. So if there are no uh, no further questions, thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, we're ready for lunch. Thank you.